Hello, everyone. It's 12.30, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Mm -hmm. I did put in the chat um, if everyone could go ahead and put their name and the home they're with, so that way we can keep track of attendance. That would be great. Um, if you ever um, can't hear me or the slides aren't keeping up on um, your end, please let me know and I can try to reset them. Um, but for today's topic, we're going to go over supporting the human spirit and honoring a resident at their death. Um, we do have a guest speaker, Jennifer, from Leonardville Nursing Home, and she'll be sharing their practices here in a bit. So uh, we'll give a brief overview of what um, the peak requirements are, and then we'll get started. So the objectives for today... We are going to review um, the outcomes. We're going to learn about Leonardville's nursing home um, practices, and then we'll have some reminders and some time for Q&A at the end. So um, residents have relationships with us and friendships with um, others that live in their home. So take a moment to think about what happens in your home when a resident passes away. It's important to honor each um, individual at the time of their death. When a resident is honored, it pays not only tribute to the person who's died, um, but also a form of healing to staff and other residents who have had a relationship with that. As you kind of brainstorm and think about how this is implemented in your home, consider different individual ways to honor residents um, rather than having group memorials. The basis for this evaluation is the home able to describe their practices um, around honoring residents at the time of their death. Sometimes embraced uh, the idea of honoring residents when they die, especially as consistent staffing has the deeper relationships um, developing with these residents. The key takeaway is that something residents are, this is something that the residents are deciding um, what they want to do in their home, and they also know about it. There's a misconception um, that residents can't know when someone else has passed away. You know, this is their roommate, their neighbor, their friend, and oftentimes it's someone they've known throughout their life, especially in um, really smaller, tight communities. Um, Residents know when things are going on and whenever their friend starts um, to stop coming out for meals and activities and different events. So obviously we want to follow the resident and their family's wishes as they desire, um, but residents are allowed to know when someone passes away. So have a conversation um, when residents move in. This obviously sometimes can be a very difficult conversation to have. Um, but tell them what current residents have decided on um, as their practice to let others know and kind of see what their thoughts are and where they're at. Um, be mindful that this is a very heavy topic and um, also be mindful about when you have this discussion with them and their loved ones. We want to celebrate and honor the resident's life, but we also should acknowledge the grieving process for others. And this is why we don't believe in taking a resident, you know, out the side door and try to hide it um, from residents and staff. It's part of the grieving process and we want to celebrate their life. So here are some examples that some peak homes have implemented. Um, you can place a single stem flower on the resident once the body has left. Other residents the basket, like with the cards sign, and then uh, your team would send them to their family. Leaves the home. Residents form the body of the home. Community circle day after the death. Their story about rest. Food activity in honor of them. So now we're going to hear um, from Leonardville with Jennifer. Um, she's been a nurse for 26 years. 
She's worked in long-term care um, right after graduation before moving into respiratory therapy at Republic County Hospital. And then she went off to Belleville Medical Clinic. And she's been at Leonardville Nursing Home for about 20 years now. She was the MDS coordinator prior to being the director of nursing. A fun fact about her, her and her husband have five daughters and one son. The next year is going to be very busy for her. Her daughter's getting married in Florida next June. One daughter is expecting her first child in February. And one daughter is starting college here this fall. And one just started uh, high school in August. So she's got fun times ahead. So I'm going to toss it over to Jennifer. All right, well, hello friends. And as JC said, I'm Jennifer, and we are so proud to be a participant in the PEAK program and happy to be with all of you today. Again, for those of you that don't know, um, Leonardville Nursing Home is a small rural home located north of Manhattan. We have 47 elders. And our facility is comprised of three small neighborhoods who, while under one roof, um, function independently of one another. I'm going to do a lot of reading today because if I don't stay on script, I tend to get excited and go in all different directions. And um, we want to stay on the topic at hand, so bear with me. Um, today, we're going to chat about something that's near and dear to my heart. I have always considered it one of the greatest privileges we have, seeing someone through from this life to the next. But what happens in our facilities when an elder passes away? Do we go the distance for our staff and our families to provide a time of closure? And do we celebrate the life of the one we loved and cared for? I'm gonna start with a short story. We often talk, especially when going through the PEAK program, about having aha moments. And I think oftentimes something has to affect us personally for us to be like, aha, I get it now. I had one of those aha moments several years ago. Whether we want to admit it or not, most of us have a particular elder that we grow fond of a little attached to. They hold an extra special place in our heart. And for me, that elder was Richard. And when Richard passed away, while there was sadness in the building, there was no real intentional time set aside for mourning as a staff. There was no time for the elders to mourn, for talking about him and sharing stories of his life, for closure. I wanted him celebrated. Richard was a funny, quirky little man. He was a veteran, but he was just here one day and gone the next. And I took that personal. It felt like an injustice because he adored all of us so much and it felt like we let him down. It felt like he didn't mean to us what we meant to him. And if I, as a caregiver, felt that way, I began to wonder how elders must feel, how families must feel when their loved one passes away and we just carry on with business as usual. We can all say all day long that elders are special to us, important to us, mm -hmm. and they are why we do what we do. But if we don't show that love and respect and consideration from beginning to end, have we truly done our best? Again, this was my aha moment. Leonardville has been on our peak journey for a little over 10 years now. But it was only until more recently that we realized we were dropping the ball when an elder passes away in our building. There was nothing in place that was intentional, deliberate, or consistent. So in recognizing this as an area we really needed to grow, develop, and improve mm -hmm. on, our leadership team asked for volunteers 
and a committee was formed to tackle this project. The committee was made up of nurses, direct caregivers, homemakers, um, life enhancement, administration, and elders. After a few months of meeting and working through an action plan, we now have a system in place that we are proud of and happy to share. I'm going to hit on a few of the major changes we made in our building as a result of the committee's efforts. The first thing the committee did was look at what currently was happening in our building when an elder passes away, the process. What did we like about it and what did we not like? As many of your homes, I'm sure, we did the usual card signing by staff. We sent a flower or plant to visitation on behalf of the facility, but we wanted to do more. What could we do on a more personal level? The majority of committee members wanted to address the piece involving the funeral home. We all know that the funeral home needs to be contacted when an elder passes away. And I think we can all agree that sometimes it can be uncomfortable for elders, visitors, even some staff to witness the coming or going of the funeral director and the gurney down the halls through the facility. We wanted to address this with greater sensitivity. Now, when someone from the funeral home arrives, they no longer automatically enter through the front door, but rather through the door nearest the elder's room. We had never tackled this before, because though we have no overhead paging or call light noise, our exits do have alarms and wonder guard in place. And honestly, it can get a little cumbersome and inconvenient if the front door isn't used. And that's what we realized. Our current process was easier for us, but it wasn't what was best. This simple change has provided an increased respect and privacy for the family who are usually at bedside. It has decreased anxiety and uncertainty amidst elders and visitors. It keeps a personal matter personal in a neighborhood. We should have thought about this small detail a long time ago because oftentimes it's the smallest things that can make the biggest world a difference. I don't know. Even with shortening the distance, a funeral director has to travel in the building. There was still just something about the coldness of the process. A big part of that coldness for us was the handling of the body. It seemed so impersonal, just cold. So the members of the committee sat down and visited with our local mortuaries about their concern and how we could address it. And guess what? They understood. And they were more than willing to have a conversation. So what could we do? What could we come up with to change how the body is taken out of the building? It needed to be simple, but different, personal, but consistent. After much discussion, it was decided that now when an elder leaves our building, they are covered gently by a quilt specific to the neighborhood in which they live. There is no cadaver bag, just a quilt. The quilt represents love. It represents care and compassion and that the elder was a part of a family here that adored them. We get the quilt back from the funeral home and tuck it away until the neighborhood has to say goodbye again to someone they treasured and cared for. So to this point, our team had addressed the funeral home entering the building, the covering of the body in a more personal, respectful manner. Now we needed to talk about the funeral home exiting the building with the body. If you stop and think about it, 
An elder rarely comes into our facilities for the first time by themselves. So why should they leave for the last time alone? They will never cross through your doorway again. And that means something. So at Leonardville, after an elder has been covered with the quilt and the funeral home director is exiting the building with them, all available staff stop what they are doing and accompany that elder out. That's CNAs, homemakers, nurses, administration, everyone that is able. We have decided and committed to the notion that nobody leaves alone. It's powerful, it's personal. And while it usually takes less than a couple of minutes, it is one of the most impactful acts of gratitude and respect our team can do. Next, the committee established the role of bereavement coordinators. While all neighborhood staff are involved in end of life care, we wanted a specified individual for the bereavement process. In addition, it was important to us to have someone for bereavement in each neighborhood rather than one person for the entire building. This was because of the relationships that are formed through consistent staffing. A bereavement coordinator is one of those positions that can be held by anyone and it is in addition to the role they already have. Oftentimes when we think of career ladders in our building, we think of a vertical climb, like a CNA to a nurse or a dietary aide to a dietary manager. A bereavement coordinator position is more horizontal in nature. It doesn't come with a license or with extra pay. It's about growing personally and professionally and contributing to the neighborhood in which one works. For example, a direct caregiver can be a bereavement coordinator. A homemaker can be a bereavement coordinator. A nurse can also take on that role. In our building, we now have three bereavement coordinators, one in each neighborhood. These three individuals know their elders. They've had a relationship with them. More than likely, they played an active part in their end of life care. Bereavement coordinators are the primary team members responsible for overseeing several key things in their specific work area. And they really come into play in the days following an elder's passing. A variety of sympathy cards are always available in our library for elders to go through and select one to give. Bereavement coordinators ensure that the cards turned in arrive timely to the families. The team did decide to continue to have a flower sent to the funeral home or a tree planted in an elder's memory. And bereavement coordinators also make sure that this takes place. Another responsibility of our bereavement coordinators involves neighborhood memorials. Our committee got together with each neighborhood and decided to have a designated space in each area where a memorial display is set up to honor the life of their elder. Each neighborhood has their own special way of setting up their memorial and it is the bereavement coordinator who really dedicates the time to ensuring it happens. One of our neighborhoods has chosen to display an eight by 10 photo of the elder along with their obituary. Another likes to display mementos or little items that were specifically important to the elder who has passed. Our memory care neighborhood has built a rock garden in our patio pond area with the names of past elders painted on the rocks as a tribute and a dedication. However a neighborhood chooses to display their memorial, it is always easily accessible to elders, visitors, and staff. It's amazing how many will stop and read what is displayed or look at the pictures and just take a moment to remember. 
These memorials are left in place for a couple of weeks. The rocks, of course, remain. While traditional visitation and funeral home dates are often present on a neighborhood memorial display and do offer the opportunity for elders, families, and staff to be informed and attend if they wish, we wanted to go a step further. We wanted to ensure that all who wanted to pay their respects and attend a service could. So our committee got together with one of our local pastors, and we now have our own small service for elders who called Leonardville home. Again, our bereavement coordinators are the ones who will contact our pastor when they have an elder pass away in their neighborhood. And together with input from family, we'll determine a day and time to hold a small service in our facilities chapel. The date and time for an in-house service is posted in the neighborhood and in our building's common space. This allows for all who might have known the individual to have the opportunity to attend, like other elders who live in a different neighborhood in the building, staff who work in a different neighborhood, visitors, and volunteers. Family is always invited and encouraged to come. The services are usually around 20 to 30 minutes. They are informal in nature with the encouragement of sharing stories and fond memories, the reading of the obituary, a time of prayer and a time of reflection. So far, I've attended every service we've hosted and every time I learned something new about an elder that I didn't know before. It brings a peace. It brings a comfort. It brings closure. It brings a sense of belonging. And I can see that on the faces of the elders who attend. They know it will not just be business as usual in our facility ever again. There will be intentional committed time to stop and pause and remember and celebrate the life of someone we had the honor of caring for. Of course, there are other small happenings personal to a neighborhood that may occur that I don't always know about. A group spontaneously sharing special memories of an elder over coffee in the morning or going through a neighborhood photo album and looking at pictures and talking about memories of them while sitting out on the patio. I may not know all of those little things taking place, but what I do know for sure is that the process we now have for honoring those who have passed has changed us. We've been practicing person-centered care for a long time, but there is something about sitting down and sharing in a group with your peers, with family, with elders, about someone you all cared for and loved that takes person-centered to a whole different level. In conclusion, if you haven't, start looking at the process in your building. Is there more you could do? Is there something you could improve on? It doesn't need to happen overnight. Select a target date and aim for that. Be creative. Get your team together and make a choice to make a change and how you handle the passing of an elder in your facility. Be consistent. Be intentional, be personal. The impact is incredible. Start talking to your staff, to your elders and your families. Start getting their input and their ideas and start watching for that aha moment. I'd like to close with a quote. As caregivers, we are the ones who open the eyes of a newborn and gently close the eyes of a dying man. It is indeed a high blessing to be first and last to witness the beginning and the end of life. Thank you for having me and thank you all for what you do in the lives of our elders.
Thank you, Jen, for sharing all of your practices. That was, um, it's very heartwarming to hear what what things are going on in the communities and what's really happening and what can be done um, to support staff and residents when this happens. So thank you. Thank you for having us. So yes, you're welcome anytime. So I do have a couple of announcements um, before we are done today. So if you haven't already, please put in the chat your name and what home you're with. Um, if you have any changes in your team leadership point of contacts, please notify our team. We don't know those when those changes happen. Our next lunch and learn will be about relationships, about the core in general in October. We do have a mentor home experience at Meadow Arc Hills that is open to anyone and everyone that is interested in. It is on October 14th, and the deadline to sign up is the 10th of October. I'm sure you guys have seen um, all of my emails about the conference, but this one honor and show appreciation to staff and embrace and empower residents to um, show their appreciation to their caregivers. Uh, cops, um, you should have received, but I will be sending out again um, today. Residents and friends can run the note why they want to celebrate a team member. We're asking that you either do one or both of these things. Either keep the completed card um, or take a picture of the resident giving the card to the staff member with their permission. We're gonna have a display board at the conference for home to put up their celebration notes and also include the residents of the, um, pictures of the residents in the class to the team. Ideally, we would like to have both, um, but we recommend having like a thank you station in different areas throughout your home and having a box or some sort of instructions um, specific to your home to communicate um, what they're supposed to do. So if you guys could set those um, by Friday, October 4th, if you're going to submit them virtually or else bring the physical cards with you um, the day of the conference and we'll have someone help you, um, show you where they're at to get them pinned up. If you have any questions about this, please reach out. Another cool thing that we're doing um, October is Residence Rights Month. The theme of this is the power of voice. We're asking residents to submit art that shows what makes them feel empowered or anything that follows the theme, the power of voice. So any submissions on poetry, art, um, music, songs, photography, anything like that would be wonderful. Um, please get those turned in um, that Friday before the conference on the 4th. If you have physical um, projects, just bring them with you the day of and we'll get them put up on a display table. Um, but we look forward to sharing and highlighting both our residents and staff at the conference. Now um, I will be available for some questions and answers. And I think Jennifer um, should be able to stay on for a few minutes. Sure. If you have any questions for her about her presentation, um, we are available. So we'll be on for probably, um, five minutes or so, 10 minutes, and then we will be ending the call. But thank you everyone for taking time out of your day um, to learn about this outcome and then to learn about Leonard Bell. And I will be sending out the slides um, after the presentation as well. There is a question in the chat. We struggle with HIPAA when announcing death. How do you get around that? Is that for me? Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, you know what? We um we have not had an issue with that. 
Um, we we post uh, just a small announcement in our common space and the neighborhood posts that as well. And as long as, as the family um, is acceptant of that, which they have been from the beginning, uh, we have not, we haven't run into that issue in our building. We have another question who was asking who wrote the quote that you had on your last slide. So I'll go oh, back. Oh, good night. I, you know what? I am so sorry. I don't have a name for you, but if you Google that quote, I bet you can find it. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, if there are no questions, I'm at a mentor home experience today and we're actually um, wrapping up our lunch break. So I need to get back so up and help. And then um, I will be sending out here this afternoon the slides from today and um, a copy of those cards. So thank you everyone and have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Sorry, I saw the feedback.